everyone, and welcome back to The Right Turn, your one-stop shop for all things fiction writing. I'm your host, author Jordan M. Griffin, and today we're talking about outlines. Do you like them? Do you hate them? And what are their practical uses? We'll talk different kinds of outlines, what they're used for, and why you might consider using one, even if, like me, you hate planning ahead in a way that feels way too rigid for your writing. Feel free to engage with this lesson in the way that makes the most sense to you, whatever that looks like. Pausing, rewinding, listening in one go-through, they're all valid as long as they help your writing get to where you want it to be. Many writers feel strongly about outlines. Either they love outlining and insist they write cleaner and more consistently, knowing where their story is going to go, or like I used to be, they eschew the restrictive nature of plotting the whole novel in advance and leaving no room for growth or change. Whether an outline makes sense for your writing really depends on a multitude of factors. Your writing style, how long the piece is, the genre of the piece, and how in-depth the plot is. I, for example, need much more of a scaffold if I'm writing something with multiple timelines. In the case of this latest novel told in two parallel timelines, I found that having certain events mapped out in order helped keep straight which events went where and which characters knew what. However, in my first novel, I wrote the entire thing from front to back with no outline. Instead, I had written a short story of the ending of the novel. In that way, I had complete free reign of what happened and what order it all happened in, but I always had a goal I was trying to reach towards. You might have something similar in your preparation progress. In my writing time, I found that the amount of research I need to do is greatly influenced by how much time I spend in the planning and the outlining stage. I am significantly less familiar with sci-fi material, things like what a double primary does to the light patterns and temperature on a planet, or what makes a planet viable for terraforming, and so I need to spend much longer on research for those things than I do on research for, say, a high fantasy novel in a world I've created. So when I'm bogged down in those research really heavy elements, I often go back to outlining to make sure that I have a place to write all that down. When I draw on history, however, uh, it's much easier for me than forecasting the future, perhaps because I've studied more history than I have space. I have a bigger knowledge base to draw on, so I need to do less heavy research than I would if I were to set my story on a ship hurtling through the stars. So when I outline for fantasy novels, uh, it tends to be much less work than it is for, say, a sci-fi novel. Your own writing process will influence whether or not you will benefit from an outline as well. If you're a person who writes their novel from page one through to the end, you may have less need for an outline. Each piece builds on the last, and so at no point might you feel you need to revert to a roadmap to see where you are. I always know where I left off when I write like this, and so I know where to pick back up. However, if you're a person who writes scenes out of order, an outline or some sort of way to keep track of those might be a good idea for you. It would certainly make fitting the scenes together later much easier. Now that we've got some background information on outlines, let's discuss what different types of outlines might look like. Many writers, my younger self included, think that outlines have to be really rigid things like we wrote in elementary school when we drafted essays. Intro, body one, two, three, conclusion. In creative writing, that might look like a list of events in the order that you want them to happen. In actuality, though, an outline can look like whatever you need it to be. It's a document that can grow and change and develop as much as you need it to. One option for an outline I'll call a three-part structure. It's a pretty simple outline as it only has three things you need to know. Your inciting incident, your climax, and your resolution. It sounds super clinical when you put it that way, so let me break it down in a way that makes much more sense to me and hopefully will to you as well. The inciting incident is the moment something happens to the protagonist that allows them to chase after their core want. And this is a term that we'll use quite a bit in this episode. The want of a character um, is essentially what they feel that they're missing or what they're going to go after in the novel. So if a character has never felt like they belonged anywhere and always wanted to find where they fit in, the inciting incident could be when a stranger comes to town and tells the character they're the long-lost heir to the throne. 
then that character might choose to follow and find their new family, thus kicking off the story. Or if a character's core want is fame and glory, maybe they get a chance to play a show where talent scouts will be looking. They're going for their big break. Whatever happens, the inciting incident is something that aligns with the want the character has. The next part of this three-part outline is the climax. Now, a lot can and should happen between inciting incident and climax that's not covered in this outline, and that's okay. Think of this specific outline as a minimalist one. You have some guiding lines, but otherwise, the road is all yours. Let your characters lead you along it, meandering where they will, knowing all the way you're building towards a goal. Okay, so climax is essentially when a character must make a decision between their core want and their core need. For example, let's look at the character whose core want is to belong. They go with this official and they are accepted into the court. They finally have what they asked for. But, like all stories, there's a catch. Perhaps the court is full of double-crossing, backstabbing courtiers who would just as soon smile at the young child as stab him in the back. They've run the treasury completely empty and people are starving. The climax, then, might be this child rejecting the court as they realize as much as they want to belong, it matters more to them that the government be run well. This character's need, then, is to rise to the responsibility of the office thrust upon them. They need to take care of their people, even if it sacrifices the want and everything they did to get it. They're, they're essentially now going to be rejected by the very society they craved. This is what makes a good climax. The character must give something up in order to go after their higher potential or um, do the right thing or whatever realizing that need looks like for the story. The last piece of the three-part outline is the protagonist then either achieving that need or failing to achieve that need, depending on how your story is going to go. If you have a quote-unquote up ending, the character will achieve their need. If you have a quote-unquote down ending, the character will fail to achieve their need. In some stories, hopeful ones usually meant for children, sometimes the character can actually achieve both the want and the need in the end. If anyone has seen the Disney movie Encanto, you know that Mirabelle's want is to be as special as the rest of her family. Partway through the movie, she gives up that want in order to pursue the need, which is to protect the family, even if that means giving up the magic that she's always craved. The climax of that movie occurs when she fails miserably. The casita falls and she runs away. She finds her abuela who has been looking for her and they reconcile. In that reconciliation, Mirabella is able to bring her family back together, thus achieving the need. And in doing so, the casita comes back to life and she gets the want as well. Other stories might have a character fail on one or both accounts, like I just talked about. Either way, the third part of the three-act structure is the character either achieving or failing to achieve their need. I think breaking a story down this way helps to create satisfying emotional arcs for the characters and prevents stories from getting too over-the-top, laser-in-the-sky, big battle with their climax. Remember that a climax is called such because it is the most emotionally potent part of the story. Sometimes it is emotionally potent because of a large life-or-death battle, but other times it's potent because two characters are finally seeing each other for the first time, or two characters have finally kissed after staring at each other for 200 pages. Either way, focusing on the emotional core of the story will ensure your narrative remains cohesive and moving. I like the three-act structure because it allows a lot of room for change. I'm a person who tends to make things up as I go along, letting the story and the characters breed their own ideas, and this structure is a really good fit for that. There's no events that have to go in a certain order, no rewriting you have to do if one character decides to do something different than you thought they would, and yet it still gives me a structure because I have these milestones I'm working towards. I'm always writing towards a goal. The first goal is writing towards that inciting incident. Once you get to the inciting incident, you're writing towards that uh, climax. And once you get to the climax, you're writing towards the realization of the need. For those of you who might want a more rigid structure, however, I present to you the seven-part outline. I've also used this one, especially if I'm writing more plot-heavy or complex stories. 
I like this structure because it still focuses on the emotional through lines of the story and so helps keep the narrative cohesive. It does have a little wiggle room for how characters get from one step to the next, so it's not too too restrictive, um, but it gives much more of a scaffold for those writers who do want the extra road signs. So the seven-part structure starts with step one, the opening. A character exists within some status quo. They have a job, a task, a position. They are in surroundings they are familiar with. The length of this step will vary depending on how much work you might have to do building your world and the relevant parts of the character's life. A world that we are familiar with will require a much shorter opening. A world that we are not familiar with might require much more of an opening. At some point, you will reach step two, catalyst. Something happens to the character, and this is important. The character does not make any decisions about it at this point. Something happens to them that disrupts their status quo. Someone might die, or someone might arrive in town, or they get told they are the chosen one in the prophecy. Whatever it is, it must disrupt their life significantly enough that the character is forced to make a choice about it. And that choice brings us to step three. I call step three no going back. At this point, the character makes a decision that cuts them off from their previous self. There is no way for them to return to the life they were once living. You can do this by moving the character geographically. You can move the character temporally, so there's a time shift. Uh, You can change their societal status. Maybe they come into a lot of money or they lose a lot of money. Uh, For example, what if a character is framed for a murder they didn't commit? Step two, right? That's an inciting incident. And then they decide to go on the run and clear their name. That part's the step three. They may have been informed that they have been chosen as the neighborhood witch's new apprentice, right? That information is step two. Something happens to them. And then they decide to check it out for themselves and see what this is all about. That's step three, the decision. You can see how step two and three are quite intertwined. However, the distinction between them could not be more crucial. Step two, the catalyst, is not something the character has agency over. Step three, no going back, is a choice the character makes freely and readily. Some time will pass. The character might learn more about their new surroundings, or they might just be trying to keep up with the way that their lives have changed. But eventually, we will get to step four. Things go wrong. The character winds up in some sort of trouble. This might be a series of financial decisions that go wrong, or an approaching army that is nearing by the day, or a failure in the spaceship. It may or may not be the characters doing that they wind up here. Maybe they've tried their best, but it's not working. Maybe they're bullheaded and refuse to see that things are taking a turn for the worst. Keep in mind that at this stage, the character has not advanced so far that they can't backtrack. They can still return to step three. So they can't go all the way to step one, but they can still get back to step three. So if they're that witch's apprentice and they're really bad at magic and everything is going wrong, they can still go back and say, no, no, I, you know, I don't want to be an apprentice anymore and try again. Another way to think about this is that they still have options. That advancing army may not be turning around, but the character has several different things they can do about it. They can offer diplomacy or bribe the invading leader or burn and salt the fields they land on or even march their own troops out to meet the invaders. At some point, however, we will reach step five, crisis. The worst has happened. Things are dire. The character has no other options. Maybe they've been betrayed, or the antagonist has gotten the upper hand, or the person they were trying to protect has indeed died. Whatever it is, they are out of options at this point. They must resort to that thing that they didn't want to do, or that person they never wanted to see again, or something similar. They put aside their own pride and examine what is really at stake here. Often, dramatic and profound character introspection will happen at this stage, and between step five and the next stage, the character is going to essentially let go of their want and start to understand their need. So if they are that the leader of the invading army, right, or they're trying to figure out what to do about the invading army, if they really, really wanted peace, but peace is not going to protect their people then they might let go of that want and realize their need, which is 
whatever they have to do to protect their people. Eventually, we will get to step six, climax. Acting upon the introspection, the character is able to rise to the occasion and meet whatever force is uprooting their life. This might be confronting their mother or coming up with a sneaky plan to stop that invading army or matching their political rival at the big debate. No, not all stories, and we covered this before, but not all stories must have a character successfully overcome this challenge. If you're writing a story in which a character's failure is a very large part of your plot, such as a fatalistic story or a commentary on the hubris of pursuing an endeavor that you were in no way qualified for, your character may not come out of this step victorious and your story might end on a down note. That's totally fine. You can work this outline into whatever way makes the most sense for your character. This brings us to the final step, step seven, resolution or change. I like to think of this step as picking up the pieces. If your story's climax was a big blowout fight between the members of the family, then what happens next? Are there apologies that are made and the characters reconcile? Or does one person storm out the door and never come back? Your protagonist will have to settle into whatever the new normal is, and that's what this step is about. Once the story is at a place where the reader has achieved an appropriate amount of closure, you know, you'll need more for standalone novels, less for series, then you're good to say your goodbyes and get out of your story. Now, of course, this outline can be tweaked to fit your stories and your characters' needs. It's important to note that not every step will take the same amount of time. I find in my own stories, step two, which is the catalyst, happens really quickly in the novel. I tend not to spend a whole lot of time on the status quo. I just kind of throw them in there. Step three and four for me then actually take the majority of the novel. And by the time I get to the climax, things start happening very quickly again. Whatever it looks like for you, however long you take for each step, it's perfectly all right. The outline is not meant to be uniform. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It's meant to grow and change with your character as your understanding of your story evolves. I found that often by the time I hit the midpoint of my novel, who I thought the characters were at the beginning is wildly different than who they actually turn out to be. I then usually have to go back to the beginning and tweak the character in the prose so that it reflects my new understanding of my character. This is normal. I think a lot of newer writers get scared by the amount of change that happens to a story as it builds upon itself. They think that all their work is wasted if they cut those 50 pages that aren't working and rewrite them. In actuality, that could not be farther from the truth. The story is so much better because you wrote those 50 pages, even if you do end up cutting and rewriting them. You understand your character much more now than you did at the beginning, and you can much more confidently take the story where you know it needs to go. So don't shy away from revision. Honestly, revision is half the fun, and we'll do another podcast topic on revision itself because there's a lot we can talk about there. But I think a lot of people divide in their heads the writing and the revision, and it really shouldn't be that way. The revision is just step two of the writing. The last style of outlining I'll cover is courtesy of fantastic genre writer Molly Gloss. If you haven't heard of her, I highly re recommend that you check her out. Um, she writes pretty much everything. She has a speculative fiction novel called The Dazzle of Day. Um, she has Jumping from Horses, which is a like a homestead Western type of novel. Um, she's an amazing writer and amazing novelist. And I had the honor of working with her when I was in my MFA program. At one point, I heard her speak about her own writing technique at a residency I attended in June of 2022 at Pacific University. In that lecture, she spoke about her general dislike of outlines. She, like many of us, didn't like having to constantly go back and reframe her story as she learned more about her characters. Instead, she found that the most effective way for her to get ideas down was to make a list of all of the events she wanted to happen in the story and then allow those events to happen organically. Whichever order they appeared, she would write them in that order. I think it's a great idea for anyone who doesn't like following a set roadmap, especially if you're a writer who is comfortable writing scenes out of order. This might be a great way to go about your story. Write each scene as it comes to you and then at the end fit them together like jigsaw puzzles. 
One thing I do sometimes is when I'm trying to figure out the order of a story or book is to write a short summary of each chapter and then lay them out somewhere I can see them. I do this digitally on my computer or on little digital index cards. When I can see all of them, I start to put them in the order that makes the most sense. If you're a tactile person, I recommend doing this with physical cards and laying them out in your hallway or office or somewhere you have a lot of room. You'll start to see how some events lead right into each other, while others need more buildup. You should also be able to see where you might be missing pieces too, where the cards aren't lining up exactly and it's because you need to put a bridge between them. Whether or not you want to use an outline is definitely up to you. I've hopefully given you a few things to think about as far as that front, and I'll leave off by talking about some tools out there to help you outline. Microsoft Word, Google Docs, and similar programs are great places to just get words on paper. Both have tools that you can insert into the document to organize your thoughts, such as charts, tables, and even pictures if you're a highly visual person. Best of all, Google Docs is free for anybody with a Google account. For those looking for a more novel-geared type of experience, I know there are plenty of programs out there, such as Plotter, Novel Factory, Scrivener, and Plot Factory. I can only speak to the one I personally use, which is Scrivener. I love that you can pay once and use it forever, kind of like a Microsoft Word on a computer. Not a Microsoft Office account, by the way, uh, which is how they're trying to gouge everyone now. It's a monthly subscription, but the actual... Microsoft Word, just the processor. The downside of Scrivener specifically is that it's not easy to move files from one computer to the next. Theoretically, there is a way to do it, but it's never worked for me. So do be aware of that if you have to work in a space where you're on multiple computers a lot. But other than that, I really like the way Scrivener lays out its plotting tools. It even has built-in index cards like I was just talking about, so I can easily see what is happening in my story when. I actually used Scrivener to plot my latest novel in progress because it happens in two parallel timelines and keeping track of both in my head was near on impossible. Scrivener also has really convenient places to keep track of characters and research and maps and everything you might need when you're plotting a high fantasy novel and you have to completely make up a whole world and decide who's in it and what they believe and everything that goes with it. It was quite a lot. One thing that I don't do in Scrivener is actually write my novel. For me personally, the look of the word processor throws me off and the buttons aren't in the right places and I can't do it. But I do realize that Scrivener has a built-in word processor if you're interested in that. So I really like it for plotting and outlining. I don't necessarily use it for the actual writing, but I love that it keeps everything in one place. I can always go back to it and I can always add to it or revise as that novel keeps changing. Side note, because I think people have to say these things, I'm not sponsored by Scrivener. I just think they have a neat product. Um, you can check it out for yourself and decide if it fits your writing needs or not. It's completely up to you. Whatever you decide to do about outlines, I encourage you to play with the idea. At least consider it. Maybe there's a style of outline I haven't discussed that will totally work for you. Whether you want to try one or all or none of the options covered here, remember that there aren't any wrong ways to do things in writing. As long as it's something that helps you, that is all that matters. I hope this talk was helpful to you. Please feel free to go back, pause, or replay any part that you want to hear again. If you're interested in telling us a story about your own writing experience or sharing your work with us, especially if you have another form of outline you want to tell us about, or you just want to say hi, you can send an email to writeturn at gmail.com. That's W-R-I-T-3, the number three, T-U-R-N at gmail.com. Or you can click the link in the description of this episode. If you'd like to engage with the community in other ways, you're welcome to subscribe to the newsletter at jordanmgriffin.com, which will tell you when new episodes come out since we're about on an every other week upload schedule right now. I hope for that to go to an every week schedule uh, after, probably after April 14th, I can be much more consistent with these. Um, but in addition, I do have an Instagram also, which will let you know when I upload videos and podcasts and things. Uh, link will be in the episode description. As always, I hope this episode was helpful to you, and I wish you all the best in your own writing. Have a great day, and if it's not a good one, I hope that the next one is better. See you next time.